We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online. And then we have in-person services on our campus at 9 and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Well, good morning. Now, I'm sure that um, all of you have been paying attention to the news over the past week or so. And so before we jump in with today's message, I just want to go ahead and lead us in a prayer. We're going to pray and uh, lift up the situation in Ukraine right now, the war that's going on there. So let's pray. Uh, Father God, we come before you, and uh, we recognize that we are a small spot on the globe, God, and um, we know that you are here with us. We know that uh, you're not limited to here, Father. You're the sovereign God of all of the earth, and so, God, we thank you for that, and, um, and God, we, we pray that your hand, that your sovereign hand would be with the situation that's unfolding over in, in Eastern Europe. God, last week, as we looked at your word, we saw that you, um, you use evil for good. And we believe that you do that in our lives. We believe that you do that not just for individuals, but, uh, but globally. We, we believe that you do that for, for nations as well, God. So we pray that you take the evil that is taking place right now, that you would work that for good. And God, we also recognize that there are churches just like us uh, on both sides of the Ukraine-Russia border uh, full of believers, people who are committed to following you, God. We pray, one, for their safety. We pray for their protection, God. We also pray that you would, uh, you would use this to bring many people to you, that through them and through their faithfulness to you, that, uh, that they would stand out as a light and that many people on both sides of that border would, uh, would follow you, that you would grow your church uh, through, through the events unfolding, God. Uh, we also pray for, for wisdom and, for, um, and for, for strong leadership from the governments of the world. And Father, we pray that you would use their leadership for the saving of many lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's jump in with today's message. Uh, We're in a series called, Where is God? This is a good question. It's a question that we've probably all asked of ourselves at some point or another. Where is God? Um, I have just kind of a standout memory for me of one of the first times I really remember hearing someone asking this question. It occurred when I was... 17 years old, I was a senior in high school, and I'd gone to a preview weekend at a college at CBU, the the school that I ended up going to. And so they were having us who were prospective students housed housed with current students. And I got to talking with one of the guys who I was staying with, and the conversation, it turned into a spiritual conversation. And at one point, I just remember, he just kind of looked at me and shook his head, and he said, you know, honestly, sometimes I just wonder if when I pray, if I'm just talking to the ceiling. And so, we, you know, we talked about that a little bit. I was 17. I didn't really know what to say, but uh, we talked about that a little bit. And uh, that was it. That was the only time that I had a conversation with him. I didn't fo- have any follow-up. So I don't know if he got discouraged and if he gave up or if he actually sought answers and, and got, got help. But I think that the reason that that conversation stands out to me is it's really the first time I remember noticing someone who was genuinely asking this question that we're asking here today. He was asking where is God? He was saying, I feel like I'm praying to the ceiling, but he's really asking just, where is God? And so since then, since I was 17, I've noticed that many times. I've noticed that questions show up in myself and in others. And one of the things that I've come to realize is that if you're asking that question, where is God, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. And, and it's not a bad question to ask. In fact, if anything, it really means that you are using the mind that God gave you to ask important questions, to ask big questions. So it's a good question. It shouldn't drive us to panic. It shouldn't drive us to despair if that's a question that we have. Instead, it should motivate us to actually be proactive and seek answers to that question. Uh, Another thing that I've noticed in myself is that this isn't a question that usually comes up when everything is going great. It's not a question you ask when life is just peachy. Where is God? Uh, this This is more, this is not so much a good times question. It's more of a hard times question. Now, if you watched the, the Super Bowl a couple weeks ago, and you kept watching after it was over, then you saw Cooper Cup receive the Super Bowl MVP award, which was pretty cool. And uh, in his speech, then what you saw, if you are paying attention, you heard him say, God is good. He won the Super Bowl MVP, and he said, God is good. And so I heard that, I thought, no, that's great, good for him. I, I hope that if I had that same platform, which I don't expect to have that same platform anytime <laughs> soon, I think my Super Bowl MVP days are behind me, but, um, but I hope that if I had that same platform, that I'd say the same thing. I hope I'd say, 
God, God is good. So it's cool that he said that, but also it, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? It's, it's more what you would expect someone to say in that situation. It would be very surprising if someone who just won the Super Bowl MVP said, where is God? What if you just got, if you just got a, your dream job? If you, if you just got a promotion, that's not the time when you're asking, where is God? No, you're asking that question when times are hard, when things are not going your way. It's when things aren't going our way that are lingering doubts about God, whether it's about his existence or whether it's about his goodness, that those doubts kind of bubble up to the surface. And so this morning, we're going to address not just where is God, but we're going to address where is God when life is hard. And so for perspective on this question, what we'll do is we'll look at the story of Gideon from the Bible in the Old Testament, and we're going to see that in Gideon's story, just like with pretty much every single character in the Bible, his story takes place in a difficult context. Times are hard. If you look at characters in the Bible, you see a lot of hard times. That's a major theme you see running through. And so we'll look at that and we'll see that in his hard times, he did some things that we really want to emulate, some things we want to copy, but we'll also see that he did some things that we want to avoid. And one of the things he did that we want to avoid is we'll see Gideon had this habit of asking questions that were unhelpful and unproductive questions. So specifically, we'll look at three questions that are unhelpful and that we want to avoid from Gideon's story. And then on the flip side of that, we're going to look at three helpful questions that we can ask. So we can look at these as kind of substitute questions. We don't want to ask the unhelpful ones. Well, what are substitute questions that we can ask, that we can put in their place? So you can read the story of Gideon in the Bible in Judges chapters 6 and 7. We're going to go through it pretty quickly, but if you want to read the whole thing, check out Judges chapter 6 and 7. That's the portion we'll be talking about today. It's Judges 6, though, that sets the scene for Gideon's hard times. So the times was this. Uh, Israel had been oppressed by a nation called uh, Midian. So that's kind of the situation. They've been oppressed by the Midianites, and this has been going on for about seven years. And it was so bad that every time that Israel would have a harvest, when it was harvest season, then Midianites would come through and they would basically just take all of the harvest. They'd do these raids, and so Israel was just living in this more or less perpetual state of fear. And so you kind of get this picture as you read the chapter that Israel, they're just in this state of complete defenselessness. And their survival playbook for Israel at this point was you run, you hide, and you just try to save as much food as you can to keep your family alive. And so when we meet Gideon in the story, he's in the middle of executing that playbook perfectly. Here's what we read in Judges 6.11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak at Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So we read that he was threshing wheat. And the place that he was doing it, you'd normally be doing that on a threshing floor. Here's a picture of an ancient threshing floor. You can see it's out in the open. It's a pretty exposed place. That's where you would normally be doing this task of threshing wheat. But that's not what Gideon's doing. Instead, what Gideon's doing is he's doing the same task in a wine press. Here's a picture of a wine press, an ancient wine press. So you can see the contrast. One is out in the open, the other is basically a hole in the ground. It's a hidden place. And we read that the reason he's doing it in this hidden place is so that the Midianites don't see, hey, he's got food, and come and steal all of his food. So on the fight or flight spectrum, we see that Gideon, he is far on the, 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 um, the flight side of the spectrum. He's hiding when the angel comes to him. And that just adds some irony to the words that the angel of the Lord speaks to Gideon. Here's what he says. He says, The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So mighty warrior to the guy in the wine press hiding from his enemies is what he says. Interesting. But interestingly, mighty warrior, that's not the part of what the angel says that Gideon takes an issue with. Instead, he pushes back on the claim, The Lord is with you. He doesn't push back on mighty warrior he pushes back on, the Lord is with you. Verse 13, but sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? So here you can clearly see God is doubting the claim that, or Gideon is doubting the claim that God is with him. And these doubts show up, they're couched in this question. If God is with us, 
why has all this happened to us? And I think it's interesting to notice that his doubts, they're not based on any well-thought-out reasoning. This is kind of an, an emotional conclusion that he's coming to. Uh, his, his doubts are based simply on the fact that life is hard. And so in Gideon's math, it's very simple. Hard times equals God is absent. That's kind of the extent of his thinking here. And so this question, why did this happen? This is the first question that is unhelpful from Gideon. This is the first one that we want to train ourselves to avoid. Why did this happen? Now, what makes this an unhelpful question? Um, Certainly not all why questions are unhelpful questions. Uh, God's made us naturally inquisitive. You see that in yourself. You see that in your kids. If you have kids, you definitely, if you've ever talked to a kid, (laughs) you see the natural inquisitiveness in a kid. You see it when you look at history. That's asking the question, why do birds soar into the wind that led the Wright brothers to uncover the keys to flight? Uh, Recently, and of slightly less historical significance, me asking, why won't my computer turn on led to to the discovery that it was unplugged. So why 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 can be helpful for a range of things, from flight to my computer being unplugged? It's a good question, but why also has an ugly side to it? And we need to acknowledge that. The ugly side of why comes out in two ways. The first way is when it keeps us focused on the past at the expense of the present. When it keeps us focused on the past at the expense of the present. So... Why did this happen? It's clearly a past-oriented question. And when we choose to camp out there, camp out on why did this happen, it actually removes us from the realm of the present in which we have some real control, in which we definitely have some real responsibility. It removes us from the realm of the present, and it places us in the realm of the past, over which we don't have any control. And our responsibilities have already taken place there in the past. And that's one of the reasons why Ecclesiastes 7.10 says this, it says, do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. And this verse, can't you just kind of hear the helplessness of this question? Why were the old days better than these? Now, camping out on the past, asking why were the old days better, wishing things were different like they were before or anything like that, that's an ideal breeding ground in our hearts for self-pity. It's an ideal breeding ground for helplessness. And neither of those things is any help to us if we want to see God at work in our lives today. So that's the first one. The other ugly side of why is when it becomes a condition for our obedience. Now, as as a parent uh, with four kids, you can imagine my wife and I, we field our fair share of why questions. Uh, That's kind of the main thing I do, uh, <laughs> answer why questions. <laughs> um, and we try to answer as many of these questions as we can from our kids. Uh, but we've also had to put up some boundaries when it comes to that. Uh, one of those boundaries is that you can't just ask why, why, why on autopilot. Uh, it took me a while to catch on to this, but at some point I realized that you know, just because my kids ask why doesn't mean I have to answer it every single time. And so, uh, so you can't just ask why on autopilot in the Johnstone home. Instead, you actually have to think about what you're asking. You have to think about what you want to know. Uh, so that's one of our boundaries. Another boundary is that obedience comes first. And so even if you don't know the reason, obedience comes first. And we want to tell our kids, just like any parent, you know, we want to tell our kids why if we can, but Obedience has to happen regardless of whether or not they get to know why. Uh, the other day, uh, our kids were playing outside, and our neighbors, some neighbors, kind of got into a little bit of a scuffle. And uh, we live over toward downtown, and so scuffles are kind of normal things for us. Uh, we don't even really know why they happen most of the time. But anyway, my kids were outside, and the scuffle took place. And so they're playing. My wife realizes, okay, we got to bring the kids inside. It's not good to be outside when there's a scuffle. Um, And so she tells them to come on inside. And uh, and my kids, they did exactly what you'd hope that they would do. It was awesome. They they were confused because they didn't know what was going on. But they obeyed right away. They obeyed right away, and they saved their questions for later, after they had obeyed. And when they did that, and we were able to tell them this later, that not only did it demonstrate trust in my wife and respect for her, 
It demonstrated trust and respect, but it also allowed her to move unhindered in that situation for their best interest. And so we were able to tell them that and celebrate that with them. And this is, this is a pretty easy concept for us to grasp when it comes to the parent-child dynamic. That just makes sense to us. But then what about when it comes to the thing that is hard in your life right now, the thing that's hard in my life right now? It's much tougher to apply this to ourselves than it is to think about it between a parent and a child. Our attitude is often, you know, if, if I just knew why this was happening, if I knew why this was happening, then I could endure it. If I could just see the details, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're a detail person, if I could just see the details of how this situation that's difficult is going to end up, if I could just see how it's going to work out, or maybe you're a big picture person, if I could just see the big picture of how all this trouble, all this challenge in my life is going to come together and, and work out for good, then I could obey, then, then I could trust. But the problem with this thinking is clearly the word if. If we knew something, then we would obey, then we would trust. And so there's a condition to the obedience. But conditional obedience is not obedience. Any parent could tell you this. Conditional obedience is actually thinly veiled rebellion. But when we obey God without demanding to know why, without needing to, to satisfy our need to understand the reason behind everything that's taking place in our lives, then we demonstrate trust in him like my kids did with my wife. And we allow him to move unhindered in our lives, really for our good. So when life gets hard and we wonder, where is God? One of the most counterproductive things that we can do is stop seeking him and stop obeying him. Stop seeking his will and stop obeying him. And so if you find yourself getting bogged down by asking this question, why? Why did this happen? Why is this happening to me? Why did this happen? then instead of asking that question, consider shifting your question to this. Ask instead, what do you want me to do? This is an obedience-oriented question. And sometimes if you just you hit pause and you ask, God, what do you want me to do? Sometimes he'll just make it immediately clear to you. And you'll know, you know what, I don't understand why, but I know what my next step is. I know what obedience looks like here. Sometimes, for me, when I stop and ask that question, the thing that he shows me that I need to do something that I've all really known all along that I needed to do to obey him. I just hadn't stopped and asked. And so it's a matter of, okay, I just need to do what I already knew to do when I stop and ask that question. Uh, there are other times where you might ask this question, and it's still unclear. It remains unclear what you're supposed to do. And when that happens, that's a great time. Find someone that you trust. Find someone who's walking with God. Share the situation with them. Bring them into the loop and get their thoughts in it, and help process that, and with them, seek out what it is that God wants you to do. So it's not those who are on the sidelines having a pity party who see God show up in their lives. It's, it's not those who are holding out to know the reason why everything is taking place who see God show up. It's actually those who are seeking and doing his will. That's who sees God show up in a pretty amazing ways in their lives. So that's the first question that we want to avoid, a question to replace it with. The second question that we see from Gideon's story is the question, who is to blame? Who is to blame? Now, when life gets hard, often our knee-jerk reaction is to just look for someone to blame. It's like, if, if things can't go our way, then we'll at least settle for the consolation that it must be someone else's fault. Uh, we'll settle for that, and, uh, and we'll be happy with that. Uh, for Gideon... There were a few targets for his finger pointing, a few obvious targets. One of those was pretty clearly the Midianites. They were the ones directly causing his problems. Uh, verse, six, six, verse 13 rather, says, But now the Lord has abandoned us. This is Gideon talking. He says, But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. So in other words, he's saying, If it wasn't for Midian, if Midian wasn't at play here, we wouldn't be running, we wouldn't be hiding, we wouldn't be starving. We wouldn't be in this situation. And you know what? He's actually right about that. That's true. He's got a good point. So what about us? What about us in the hard times that we face, in the situation going on in your life right now? Who's to blame for that? My guess is that, like Gideon, you could probably name some names. You could probably, you've got a pen and paper right now. Don't do this, but you could probably make a list <laughs> of some real specific names, people who are to blame 
for the problems in your life right now. And you know what? There's a really good chance that you would be right. Like Gideon, you'd be able to point the finger probably accurately and point out who's to blame for some of the problems in your life. Well, the problem with that, though, is what are you going to actually do about it? What are you going to do with that list? What, what, can that, what good can that list accomplish? The first question, why did this happen, that keeps us focused on a, a past that we can't control. This question, who is to blame, this keeps us focused on people that we also can't control. And so usually what happens is we have our list. The only course of action, once we've assigned blame, the only course of action available to us is to just be really angry at them and be angry at people. So this means that when you play the blame game, really your best case scenario is that you're right and you're angry. And then your worst case scenario is that you are wrong and you are angry. So not some great choices right there. Either way, the result is bitterness. You're on the road to bitterness, and you're distracted from what God really wants you to be focusing on. Now, we, we should be clear, there are people who do need to assign blame. Uh, that, that, is, that is a thing. Uh, they're called judges, they're called bosses, they're called teachers, they're called parents. And what, what each of these has in common is that they're all roles of authority. And so if you're in a position of authority, then part of your responsibility is actually determining fault for problems that occur under your watch or within your jurisdiction. But if you're not in a position of responsibility in a given area, then fault finding can become a major distraction and it can take your focus off of what you can control and instead fixate that focus on something that you cannot control. It really, uh, just kind of simple application of this for me has been uh, prices at the gas pump or prices at the grocery store. To stop grumbling about prices at the pump and at the grocery store, things that are really actually beyond my control in everyday life. Uh, I've found that if I want to be angry about those things, there's no lack of scapegoats for me to point my finger to and just kind of get angry and get mad about. But every minute that I have spent being angry about prices is really a minute that I wish that I could have back and I could give it to something else. Now, imagine if I took those minutes and instead I, I focused them on my family. Or imagine if while I was pumping gas, instead of grumbling in my head, just like a grouch, instead of doing that, imagine if I actually spent that time while I was pumping gas praying. Man, such a better investment of my time over something that I really don't have any control over in that moment. Now, another problem with the blame game, and maybe you noticed this earlier when we read the verse, but another problem with the blame game is that rarely do we limit our fault finding just to other people. Notice who is really at fault behind the trouble in Gideon's life. He said, but now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. So the Lord is the one who's abandoned us. The Lord is the one who's at fault. Blame is a very slippery slope. It might start off with your spouse, with your boss, with Congress, with whoever. But at the bottom of that slope, we always find ourselves blaming God for our circumstances. And so if I can't sleep at night because my daughter's waking up and keeping us awake throughout the night, okay, well, I can blame my daughter. Well, who gave me that daughter? God's the one who gave me that daughter. And so I'm actually accusing God of a great gift that he gave me, I'm accusing him and blaming him in that situation. And so not only is that a counterproductive, but it's really a dangerous road to travel down, a road that you don't want to go down. And so when we find ourselves going down that road, we want to make a 180 as quickly as we can. And so let's replace that question with a better question. Instead of asking who's to blame, we can ask, what do you want me to learn? What do you want me to learn from this? And this question, what it does is it takes the focus off of other people, it takes the focus off of accusing God, and, and instead it invites correction, it invites instruction from God. And so if you're going through a hard time right now, you know, it could be that you're actually the one to blame for that, that something that you did brought that hard time about. It's also entirely possible that really it was completely beyond your control, that nothing you could have done could have changed that, that these are circumstances that are not your fault in any way. But either way, God wants to use those circumstances to grow you. 
And we can either partner with him in that or we can fight him in that. And we can partner with him in that process by asking, what do you want me to learn? Going to him and trying to apply the things that he's teaching us. Uh, The next question from Gideon that we want to avoid when we face hard times is this. It's, how can I save myself? Let's read from Judges 6, 14 through 16. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. So there's two parts to this statement here. The first, he says, go in the strength you have and save Israel. And then the second is, am I not sending you? So those are the two parts. Now notice the part that Gideon really zeroed in on. He zeroed in on the go in your strength and save Israel part. And we know that because he responds, how can I save Israel? And so the fact that God said, I'm sending you, that he said, I will be with you, those things didn't factor in for Gideon. And so his problems seemed insurmountable because in his eyes, it was all up to him. It was all up to Gideon. So let's, uh, let's picture it like this. What God said is God and Gideon are greater than the Midianites. That's what God said. He said, I'm going to go with you, and because I'm with you, you're greater than the Midianites. Me and you combined, greater than the Midianites. So that's what God said. What, Midi- what Gideon heard was Gideon is greater than the Midianites. Now, he's not a fool, and so what he does is he does some quick arithmetic, and he realizes that what he just heard doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. He looks at his connections, and he realizes that he has very weak connections. He says, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. That's his tribe. So he doesn't have connections to rely on to help him out. He looks at his competence, and he judges that his competence is pretty low. He says, I am the least in my family. So I've got a weak family, and I'm the least in my weak family. So he's not exactly a picture of a a confident, a commanding, a charismatic leader that you'd think it would require for this task. Then he looks at his resources, and my guess is that when he looked at his resources, he remembered that I'm standing in a wine press to hide my food from the bad guys. (laughs) And so he knew his resources weren't going to help him out. He put all this together. He realized connections weak, competence weak, resources low. He put all that together, and he said, God, I need to correct your math here. I think, I think you did this wrong. Gideon isn't greater than Midian. Midian is greater than Gideon. So he asked, how can I save? How can I save? And he completely missed the point that God was the one that wanted to do the saving. And we do this exact same thing. Uh, in fact, this is one of the most American questions that you could ask. Us coming to our own rescue with our own resources, that's kind of the main idea of the American dream, that that famous story. But if we're determined to save ourselves, God has no problem sending us challenges that are far beyond our capacity to save ourselves. He has no problem sending us into situations so far beyond our control that if saving is going to take place, it's going to be very clear that he is the one who has done it. He's pulled it off. He's done the saving. And this is just what we read that he did with Gideon. And again, you can read this whole thing in chapter 7, but just kind of an overview of what happened with Gideon is that Gideon began to build an army to deliver Israel. Now, the Midian army was 300,000 strong. So this is a very formidable force. Gideon pulls together everyone he can, and he's got 32,000. So what that means is you've got one soldier of Gideon for every 10, right, for for Midian. But God says, you know what? That's not hard enough. You could still get the credit if if this is the situation. And so God reduces that army from 32,000 all the way down to 300. Now instead of 10 to 1, now we've got 1,000 to 1. So now it's not just far-fetched. Now it's impossible. Now this 300, this is not an army. This This is a joke is what he has over here to work with. But God took these 300 men, and in such a way that it was very clear who had done the saving, he actually uses them and uses Gideon to deliver Israel in a way where he gets the credit. It's clear that God is the one who has done the saving. And so for us, when we hit hard times, the most natural thing in the world is for us to, like Gideon, ask, how can I save me? How can I save myself? That's natural. But less native, but more helpful 
is this question that we can replace it with. Instead, we can ask, will you help me trust you? Okay, so, so far in our story, Gideon, he's been the example of what not to do, the questions not to ask. But when it's all said and done, he's actually listed in the Bible along characters like Noah, Moses, David, as one of the greatest heroes of the faith. So he actually proved to be a great hero of the faith, but he's also a very relatable hero. And the reason that he's relatable is that he actually doubted God, and we can relate to that. He, he doubted God, but he pushed through that doubt. He went out on a limb, trusted God, and then saw, saw God come through for him in a major way. And the reason that he pushed through his doubt isn't that he was just such a great guy, that he was so amazing. The reason he pushed through his doubt, as you read the story, you see, is that God was very good to him. God was patient with him. God was gracious with him. And God was very kind to him. And this is probably the most well-known part of Gideon's story. And, and what happened is before Gideon actually went out and started doing what God had told him to do, he asked God to confirm that he was really with him. He wanted to know that God was really with him. And so let me read that section for you. It's about five, five verses from Judges chapter 6. Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. Back to that threshing floor. Place a wool fleece out there. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew into a bowl of water, or to a bowl full of water. And then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. And this is my favorite part of the story. You can just get the picture. He's just thinking, please God, be patient with me. I want to obey, but I'm really nervous. I need some help here. So he says, don't be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more time to test with the fleece. But this time, make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered in dew. And that night, God did so. Only the fleece was wet. All of the ground was covered with dew. And so for us, it would be easy to draw the wrong conclusion from this story. The idea here is not that if the Bible clearly tells me to do something, that it's okay for me to require that God perform a series of miracles before I actually obey what he's told me to do. That's not the idea here. The idea here is that when I lack faith, when I wonder, where is God? I can actually be honest with God about that like we see Gideon was here. I don't need to put on a show. I don't need to just try really, really hard to increase my faith. Instead, I can ask for help, and it pleases God when we ask for help, when we recognize our lack of faith, and instead of trying to save ourselves, we ask him to increase our trust in him. Now, there was a time when Jesus, when he was on earth, he was approached by a man who had a, a son who needed healing. And the man was just desperate for his son to be healed. That's why he came to Jesus. And he said to Jesus, if you can, help us. Jesus said to him, if you can, he said, everything is possible for him who believes. And then we see the man's reply in Mark 9, 24. It's this. He says, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Now, how identifiable is that statement right there? Have you ever thought that? God, I believe but help me overcome my unbelief. Help increase, increase my faith. And so apparently, when this man asked that, it pleased God, it pleased Jesus, because in the next verse, he healed the son. I, I believe the same is true for us. It pleases God when we do the same thing. It pleases him when we say, God, I want to trust in you, but I'm really struggling. Please, increase my faith. Help me follow you. Now, and personally, personally, I'm so glad that God does not write us off at the first sign of doubt. If that's how God operated, I would have been written off a long time ago. Instead, what I've seen over the years is that God has been very patient with me. He's been very gracious with me, and he's been very kind to me. He's consistently met me where I'm at, and he's helped me grow from wherever that is. He's been very good to me over the years. Now, when hard times come, our, our instinct our instincts lead us to ask these unhelpful questions, just like Gideon. We ask, why did this happen? We ask, who's to blame? We ask, how can I save myself? And these tend to be unproductive. They keep us stuck in 
unhelpful thought cycles. And so, you know, for you, as you look at that list, what's one that stands out to you? What's one that's like, yeah, I've asked that, or maybe I'm asking that right now? Just make, make a note. Instead, when hard times come, try asking the, follow, the, the, the corresponding question. Instead, ask, God, what do you want me to do? This is difficult, this is hard, but what are my marching orders? Ask, what do you want me to learn? How do you want me to grow through this situation that I'm experiencing? And will you help me trust you? I'm struggling. Help me trust you. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you meet us where we are at. You don't demand that we perfect ourselves before you come in and save us. In fact, you you sent your son because we have no hope of perfecting ourselves. Uh, We only can overcome our sin through you, through your son, through the sacrifice that he made. Um, But you don't just save us from our sins and leave us on our own. You continue to help us. Uh, We continue to need your help. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to be men and women who trust you and that when we lack that trust, God, that that we'd see that you come in and, and you help us. And I pray that you would continue to be gracious, kind, and, and patient with us, God, as, as we seek to obey you and follow you, that we'd see you really move in our lives as we do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.